français parce que je l'ai envoyé avec traduction comme il m'avait demandé. Répète-moi ça. J'ai traduit euh, ça et je voulais juste voir si c'était la bonne qui était mise. Non, c'est pas la bonne. C'est celle que lui a mise. Je lui ai envoyé une en français. Euh... Je vais voir avec lui. Je suppose qu'elle est sur un PC. De toute façon, le PC est connecté. Donc...
Allô, allô. Bonsoir. Vous m'entendez bien Oui. Eh bien, je, vais, je m'appelle Josué Dussoulier du réseau Transition et je vais tout de suite passer la parole à, à Bérénice qui va vous présenter euh, des événements qui vont avoir lieu à Mons euh, dans une semaine. Bonjour à tous. Plus près micro. Bonjour à tous. Vous m'entendez Ok, parfait. Euh, oui, donc, euh, comme l'a dit Josué, j'aimerais vous parler du festival Demain. Vous avez sûrement vu les brochures euh, sur toutes les tables. Le festival Demain aura lieu à partir de la semaine prochaine, euh, ici à Mons. C'est un festival qui est né de la collaboration entre les centres culturels locaux et de nombreuses associations de la ville de Mons. J'aimerais vous parler de trois spectacles, euh, enfin, trois spectacles et événements qui auront lieu euh, dans le cadre de ce festival. Le premier aura lieu jeudi prochain, le 28, à 18h. Il s'agit de la, l'apéro d'ouverture, donc vous êtes tous conviés. <rire> J'ai dit apéro, il y a eu de la réaction. Donc voilà, c'est gratuit, bien sûr. Et euh, vous pourrez également ac- euh, assister gratuitement au spectacle Ce qui m'est dû, un spectacle qui mêle danse et théâtre. Le second spectacle dont j'aimerais vous parler s'appelle « L'herbe de l'oubli ». C'est un spectacle qui a reçu le prix des critiques belges de cette saison et qui parle de la, l'accident de Tchernobyl. La troupe de théâtre s'est rendue sur place et a rencontré des scientifiques, des habitants et des rescapés pour euh, retranscrire leurs témoignages à travers un spectacle de marionnettes. Et donc, ça promet d'être... Euh, très instructif, instructif et, et poignant. Et le dernier spectacle que j'aimerais vous présenter s'intitule Burning. C'est un spectacle qui parle de la pression dans le monde du travail, qu'on subit plus ou moins tous, <rire> j'imagine. Et ce spectacle euh, est né de la rencontre d'une poétesse et d'un circassien en fin de carrière. Donc euh, vous imaginez quand on est euh, circassien, c'est un petit peu difficile euh, voilà, de continuer à... Et, enfin, faire de prouesses de son corps alors que voilà on, on va vers la, la, la fin de sa carrière et donc euh, ils ont décidé de parler de ce sujet du burn du, du burn out de la pression dans le travail et d'une manière euh, assez euh, ima- imagée car euh, voilà il y a des poèmes mais il y a également euh, une euh, le plateau qui au fur et à mesure du spectacle euh, devient de plus en plus vertical jusqu'à ne plus laisser que quelques prises euh, aux comédiens pour euh, se rattacher euh, voilà, à la réalité. Voilà, euh, bah, vous découvrirez tout ce qu'il y a d'autre dans la brochure, car ce n'est que trois petits euh, événements. Je vais vous laisser et euh, bah, bonne conférence à tous. Est-ce que vous êtes prêts oui. Donc, Rob va arriver dans une minute. J'ai quelques petites informations à vous, à vous communiquer juste avant. Euh, tout d'abord, euh, pour le, au nom du réseau Transition et de toutes les personnes qui organisent, on voudrait remercier euh, très chaleureusement l'Université de Mons euh, de nous accueillir ici et, et en fait toute la journée dans des bâtiments qui appartiennent à l'Université de Mons. Euh, on est à une conférence, mais pendant la journée, il y avait des forums qui avaient lieu et donc c'est important de les remercier. Remercier aussi toutes les personnes qui ont euh, donné un coup de main de Mons en Transition, euh, de Jurbis en Transition, enfin de, 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 de Soigny en Transition qui sont venus donner des coups de main pour aider à organiser toute cette journée euh, bénévolement. Je ne pourrais pas nommer tout le monde. Je voudrais remercier aussi euh, le La du Haut Bois, j'espère que je dis bien, le restaurant qui nous a accueillis avant de venir ici. Où on a mangé un, un merveilleux repas. Remercier le RCR et Résiway aussi, qui nous ont aidés à organiser les forums pendant la journée. Alors qu'est-ce que c'est que ces forums euh, En fait, une partie des personnes qui sont dans la salle ont participé, il y avait 150 personnes qui étaient présentes, à euh, trois forums. Euh, qui était organisé aujourd'hui autour de la question comment amplifier la transition. C'est le, le thème de, de toute une série d'événements qui ont lieu entre le 13 et le 25 avril et c'est dans cette série d'événements que prend place cette conférence. Euh, alors ces trois forums, sans rentrer très dans les détails, accueillaient trois types de publics. Un forum pour les personnes qui réfléchissent à l'entrepreneuriat en transition, 
un forum pour des, des, des personnes comme vous et moi des, qui, qui, qui se disent je vais me lancer dans des projets en transition. Et nouveauté, il y avait un forum aussi pour les jeunes, pour des jeunes entre 10 et 25 ans autour de c'est quoi pour eux la transition et qu'est-ce qu'ils qu aimeraient y faire. Et euh, au nom du réseau Transition, on était, on était vraiment très heureux de proposer ce forum jeune et d'entendre les personnes qui ont facilité ce forum nous dire c'est incroyable, ces jeunes, euh, ils sont déjà tellement matures, ils ont tellement de bonnes idées, on devrait leur donner plus souvent la parole. Donc je veux rendre hommage à ceux qui sont encore là aujourd'hui, ce soir, qui ont participé à ce forum jeune. Euh, alors, Transition Node, je vous disais, c'est toute une série d'événements avec des partenaires, je vais en nommer le CNCD, Inter-Environnement Wallonie, euh, le RCR que j'ai déjà nommé, Agroécologie in Action, Association 21, et là commence le... Tiens, si j'en oublie un, je vais avoir un problème. Le réseau ID, euh, voilà, on a, on a organisé toute une série d'événements euh, autour de cette idée, qu'est-ce qui bloque la transition On a l'impression que... Est-ce que vous êtes d'accord avec moi si je dis que la transition a besoin de grandir Un petit peu ou beaucoup Beaucoup, beaucoup oui. Hein. Et donc c'est ça le thème de Transition Now, c'est-à-dire comment on l'a fait grandir beaucoup, euh, avec toute l'importance que revêt aujourd'hui le mouvement qui se lève et les personnes qui marchent dans les rues, les jeunes qui sortent dans l'école pour aller demander un avenir, toutes ces marches pour le climat euh, et pour toute une série d'autres enjeux, euh, toute l'importance qu'il y a là-derrière. On avait envie d'organiser ces événements aussi autour de, OK, on doit dire non à toute une série de choses, mais on, on, il faut aussi qu'on fasse des propositions. Et Transition Now, c'est être force de proposition euh, de changement. Euh, deux, trois petits mots. On est à Mons. Il euh, y a Mons en transition. Il y a une vingtaine d'initiatives de transition, 22, je pense, dans la, en la province de Hainaut. Et il y en a de nouvelles, il y en a à Pérué, à Jurbise, à, je ne pourrais pas toutes les nommer, à, il y a Brugelette qui vient de démarrer euh, il y a quelques semaines, il y en a aussi du côté de Charleroi. Euh, donc si vous venez de la région et que vous voulez les rejoindre, n'hésitez pas euh, à aller vous renseigner un petit peu. Voilà, et encore dire une dernière chose. Euh, on, on fait... Euh, J'essaie d'aller chercher quelque chose là... Euh, Quelque chose d'assez particulier en Belgique, c'est que sur les trois dernières années, il y a trois ans, il y avait 40 initiatives de transition en Belgique franco francophone. Il y a des personnes dans la salle qui viennent de, du réseau néerlandophone. Je ne connais pas les chiffres aujourd'hui en, en Flandre. Euh, et bien, figurez-vous que sur les trois dernières années, le nombre d'initiatives de transition chez nous a été multiplié par quatre. Alors, je propose qu'on applaudisse ça. <rires> Et qu'à travers tous ces applaudissements, on applaudisse toutes les personnes qui participent à ça, euh, là où elles sont. Voilà. Et puis, je vais... on avait un forum avec des jeunes, et depuis le début de la conférence, ils ne m'ont pas lâché en disant « on voudrait dire un mot au micro avant que ça démarre », donc je vais les inviter, et ils vont introduire Rob. Parlez. Ah non. Votre attention, s'il vous plaît. Bonsoir à tous, ça va commencer Bonsoir. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak in English because I can't speak French, sorry. But uh, the wonderful translators are here who will do an amazing job, I'm sure. And I will talk hopefully slowly and clearly for people who want to try and follow in English. So. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say uh, I always love to come to Belgium. I think the transition movement and the work that many of you are doing here in many transition initiatives uh, in Belgium is some of the finest work happening in transition anywhere. And when I go to different countries and talk about transition, I tell many stories uh, of what you are all doing here. So on behalf of all the people outside Belgium, I just want to come and say thank you all very much for the work that you do. So I'm going to talk a bit about transition this evening, but I'm going to talk more about, uh, I'm just finishing writing a book which will be coming out in September, and so I want to talk about that because it's what my head is full of uh, at the moment. And um, it's, it's about imagination, and it'll become clear 
why I want to talk about that. <clears throat> so this is my wife uh, being arrested in London a few weeks ago. Not something she does regularly, I hasten to add. <clears throat> But this was on the first big uh, Extinction Rebellion demonstration in London, where they closed five of the bridges in London uh, to raise awareness about climate change. And uh, so this is a big thing in my house at the moment. Uh, Extinction Rebellion and discussions about uh, how do we accelerate the response to climate change. Uh, uh, and so I have, so one of my children is also very involved in the school strikes. And uh, for me, as someone who has spent the last 10, 15 years of my life involved in campaigning for climate change, it feels like the reinforcements have arrived. You know, it feels like a really, since Christmas, it, felt like, it has felt like a really powerful moment to me, that what we're seeing is the arising of, a, of a, an imaginative, bold, and beautiful no, which needs to be accompanied by an imaginative, bold, and beautiful yes. And we need both of those things uh, running alongside each other. And <clears throat> what we're seeing now through the work of campaigns like Extinction Rebellion is municipalities across the UK and in other places saying, we declare a climate emergency. This is a climate emergency. Now what do we do? I've got no idea. You know? So actually there is, some, there is a really important role now for the, for the solutions. The doors are opening for the solutions much more quickly than they did before. And so what I want to talk to you today is, uh, is about a different aspect of it. And uh, this happens often when I visit places with an, and, I, and I say, wouldn't it be a great idea? I'll give you my slides and you could translate them into French. And then I put them and then I can't remember what they actually said. <laughs> Okay, okay, I know this one, I know this one. Okay, so, so I want to, I want this, so this evening is going to be a kind of a love poem to two words, what if? And I want to give you nine eh, si questions, nine what if questions, which I think are really, really important at this moment in time. So, this is the only graph I'm going to show you all evening, don't worry. But I think this is really important because this is, this is, the, this is where we, this is our challenge, okay? We're up here. We're on top of this energy mountain. It's amazing. We can go to New York for lunch. We can, we can do all of the amazing things that cheap energy has made possible. But we have to get to here. We have to get to here very, very soon. And I feel like the problem that we face at the moment is that all the stories we tell in a culture are about how amazing this place is. That this is completely irreplaceable. There is no alternative. This is just amazing. And this, who knows? When the government says, we will cut emissions by 80% by 2050, what does that mean? What does that look like? What would that smell like? What would that sound like? What would the breakfasts be like then? What would the beer be like? What kind of parties would people have? You know, if we can't tell the stories about this, then we're really in trouble. We need to be able, for me, a big part of what we do in transition is about creating longing. How do we create longing for that, for that, for that place, for that world? Because it could still be fantastic. It could still be absolutely amazing. And the stories that we tell ourselves in our culture are all these stories. And many of us do it too in, in the movements that we're part of. We tell ourselves these stories. The collapse is inevitable. The future is going to be terrible. But actually, who says? Who says? Actually, it's still possible that we could create a future that is absolutely extraordinary. We have a period of time now where we could mobilize a transition which future generations will sing songs about and tell great stories about, about the amazing, brave, imaginative, courageous action that took place in 2022, 2025, 2030. That will happen if we can tell the right stories. 
This is the work of a, of a man who I adore, called James Mackay, who draws the future. And he doesn't draw the future, excuse me, he doesn't draw the future in a kind of science fiction sort of a way. He draws places that we recognize, and he says maybe in 30 years our cities could be like this. We could have cities where biodiversity is everywhere and where we live in wild cities. I love his pictures because, because they, they aren't science fiction. They feel completely believable to me. We could live in cities where food grows everywhere. This is the world that we wake up in the morning. We walk to school through streets where food is growing everywhere and people are having conversations and we eat well and we, and, and we spend time with other people and we no longer live in a time where we're having uh, the levels of loneliness we see in the society today is just, oh, well, that's just a side effect of having, having a good economy. And that's what we try and do in transition, is to, is to bring that into, the, into now, to give people tastes of it now. How do we create, how do we give people memories of the future? How do we give people an experience of what that future could be like that nothing else uh, is acceptable after that? So that's what we do in transition, whether it's uh, any, any of the projects that many of you have been involved in in transition are giving people a taste of what it could be like. We start now. We don't wait for permission. We start now to build that kind of a future. So I'm going, I'm going to ask you to do an exercise for me now. You're not just going to listen to me speaking for the next ages. Sometimes you might need to do some things too. So I'm going to give you an exercise where you need to be speaking with somebody next to you who you didn't know when you arrived here, ideally. Okay? Have a look around. Find who your partner might be for this next thing. Okay? Everybody have a partner? Everybody good? Okay. So, shh. So, um, by the way, I've, I, have done, I do this exercise many times and inviting people to talk to their neighbors, and I've done this now for maybe 12 years, and, or I've had three people come up and say, three pe people have come up and said, um, I came to your talk five years ago, you know that thing at the beginning where you introduce people to their neighbor? Meet my wife, and, and, and at least one baby has been introduced to me from this process, so be careful. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I am going to show you an object, okay? And it is an object that you will see most days in your life. It's an everyday object, and uh, it's the size you think it is. It's not like an enormous version. And you will have one and a half minutes with your partner to think of as many alternative uses for this object as you can, okay? They don't have to be sensible. They don't have to be economically viable. They don't have to be something you could commercially uh, franchise. Just, just ideas, okay? Oh, you could use it for this. Da, 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 da. And you don't have to write them down, but keep a tally of how many you come up with, okay? So by the end, you can say, we came up with 23 ideas or six ideas or whatever, okay? Everybody clear? So you have one and a half minutes starting now. It's a coffee cup.
Okay, thank you. So, could you put your hands up if you had more than five? More than 10? More than 15? More than 20? Ah, okay. Does anybody have one that you came up with that you thought, I really hope we get the opportunity to share that brilliant idea with all these people? They would love to hear our idea. That was so smart. Christmas decorations. Thank you. Something to hide your nose? When it's cold. Okay. As I said, not something that has to be commercially marketable. A hat. Thank you. Any up here? Sorry? A turkey umbrella. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, oh, light therapy. Okay, thank you. An instrument, okay. Acoustic balance. Oh, okay, very good. Up at the back. A portable shower. A very, very quick shower, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry? You know, I did this in Sweden. And uh, one woman said, I would use it to keep the darkness in. I, s I still wake up at night troubled by that, yeah? A telephone, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, so the reason that I like to start with that is that when you are doing that exercise, the room feels like it's full of imagination. When I look at you doing that exercise, you are, your eyes are bright and you are talking and there is a, there is a kind of a dynamic that is really uh, exciting to see. And for me, that's, that's the spirit that we need in order to be able to manage the next 20, 30 years. And, uh, Im and imagination is fascinating, the research, the science about imagination. So if people, they take a group of people, they split them in half, half the people sit in front of the piano and practice learning to play a tune on the piano. The other half of people sit in front of the piano and imagine that they are playing the piano. And after two weeks, they're almost as good at playing the piano as each other. There's, science, there's research where people exercise muscles and some people imagine they're exercising and other people actually exercise and they end up with a similar level of, 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 uh, of improvement to the muscle. Imagination is a very, very powerful thing. This is uh, um, uh, some research that was done in America. So I, the thing that started me writing this book was this, which was some research done in America where this woman looked at something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is like a, the, 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 the cre a creativity test, very similar to what you just did with the, with, with the cup. And what she found was that her conclusion was that imagination and IQ rose together until the mid-1990s, and then IQ kept rising, and imagination went into a decline and started to decline. And when she published this, it was on the front page of Newsweek magazine. And uh, there was a lot of soul searching in America. What does this mean for economic growth? What does this mean for Hollywood? I never heard anybody in the social justice, climate change world say, well, what does this mean for us? So imagination, there's a guy called John Dewey who defined it as the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise. For me, climate change is the greatest failure of imagination in history. So when we look at the world now, do we have an education system that most enables young people to see the world as if it could be otherwise? Do we have a democratic system that, uh, that enables all of us to see the world, see things as if they could be otherwise? Do we have an economic system that invites us all to see things as if they could be otherwise? Do, we have, uh, do most of us have work lives that invite us to see things as if they could be otherwise? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then we have a problem. Because we need to be as imaginative as we can possibly be if we're going to, to navigate the next few years. Oh, God. Um. 
Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's all coming back to me. So one of the reasons that the researcher said why she thought that, that we were seeing a, a, a shrinking of imagination was the decline of play. So play is something, uh, uh, this was uh, in the 1960s in, in the UK. Uh, you know, it used to be, when I grew up, we just played in the street all the time. And children had games and activities and a whole language uh, between each other and a whole world that adults knew nothing about, of tunnels and trees and hiding places and... Uh, and when they ask people now, 71% of adults say, as a child, I played out all the time, and only 21% of children play out now. The cars have won. And, uh, and there's something, though, that's really precious about having, uh, having people play. So the, there was a guy who was the mayor of Bogota in Colombia. He used to say that one of the most important well-being indicators of a city is the amount of children playing in the street. Not gross domestic product, it's how many children are playing out in the streets. And when children don't play in the streets, when children don't play, we see all sorts of problems. When we, when, when we drive play out, and when, ch when children are expected to be uh, creating their CV from the age of four, uh, we have a real problem. This is an amazing project that I visited when I was researching the book in Bristol called Playing Out. And, it's, and it helps people who want to close their street so that children can play. And it makes it really easy. You don't have to get lots of, you just fill out a form all the days of the year that you want to, to, to shut the street, and then you just shut the street. And the children play outside. And, uh, and it was absolutely amazing. All the chalk drawing on the street, and all the games that kids were learning again, uh, how to play with each other. You know, if we don't have that in our culture, if we, if we stop children being able to take risks, then we produce adults who can't take risks. And the last thing that we need at this point in history is adults who can't take risks. This is in my town where a couple of years ago uh, we organized a thing that was called a Street Games Festival, where we closed the street and everybody came out and played games together. And we had people there who were refugees from uh, Pakistan and Somalia who came along and showed, taught people the street games from their culture. And uh, it was absolutely fantastic. And there was something, there was, there was, the kids just seemed to love learning those games again. And for me, if we really want to nurture the imagination in a culture, we have to create things like this. But unfortunately, what happens is that increasingly play is something that you buy, not something that you do. This is one of the most appalling things I read about recently. This is called Hello Barbie. And I saw it, there's a video on YouTube uh, of, a, of a toy fair in America where the, a woman saleswoman is selling Hello Barbie dressed exactly like this, holding the Barbie doll. It's awful. So this is a doll which is a, a Wi-Fi enabled doll. This doll talks to your child drawing from a 280-page script and says to your child, where do you like to go shopping? How many brothers and sisters do you have? What's your favorite thing you like to do? And records their answers, which are then gathered at Mattel headquarters and used to build a marketing profile for your child. This is what people increasingly call surveillance capitalism. This idea that you build, you, you collect bits of data that enable you to do that kind of thing. And um, it's not just in dolls, it's, it's increasingly coming into our homes uh, in lots of different ways. There was a, this was, uh, didn't do as well as it should have done because a campaign group called the, the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood in America ran a campaign called Hell No Barbie to, to get this uh, stopped. And, uh, and they did really, really well. But this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this destroys your child's imagination. All the family of imaginary friends that a child is able to create are kind of displaced when something like this uh, comes into our life. Does anybody know who this uh, strange-looking man is? This is, a, this is a guy called Antanas Mokas. And Antanas Mokas was uh, the mayor of Bogota in Colombia. And this is how he ran for president as super citizen, a superhero. And he was elected as, as the, the mayor of Bogota. And uh, he, he said, um, here's what I learned 
from my time in politics. People respond to humor and playfulness from politicians. It's the most powerful tool for change we have. One of my favorite things that he did when he was elected was that he, that, so Bogota had a notoriously corrupt uh, police, uh, like traffic police in the city. And so he sacked all of the traffic police and he hired a team of 400 mime artists instead. And he said to the police who had lost their jobs, you can have your jobs back if you retrain to become mime artists. I loved that. So these guys stood on the traffic intersections telling off the naughty cars and being nice to the nice cars and they cut the, 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 the death rate on the roads by about 50%. So, you know, bringing play back in, into cities and into our everyday life is just fantastic. When there was a water shortage, he appeared live on national television uh, having a shower to show everybody what a short shower should look like. This is in the city of Bristol in the UK where they're trying to bring play back into the city. This is where they built this massive uh, slide down, down one of the main streets in the city. Why should our experience of everyday life not be one with play running through it? As we become adults, do we just stop playing? Is that okay? Why can play not become a part of our everyday life? This is one of the, my favorite things that we ever did in the, in the transition movement. In 2012, we had our national conference, and we did an event where um, 400 adults came together, and for about four hours, they built the high street, the town center of the future, out of cardboard and sticks and string and sticky tape and pens, and then played in it for about four hours and set up businesses and traded with each other and organized events. And, uh, and uh, every time I meet people now, six years later who were here, when you start talking about this event, they still get tears in their eyes. You know, there's actually, if we want to involve people in really longing for, for the future that we could still create, we need to play it. And the thing that was most amazing about this was uh, the number of people who were involved in this and who played at something and who that then became a reality for them. This was their opportunity to test drive a different way of living, if you like. So I was involved, this is me, 12 years ago, and uh, I was involved in something called the Yeast Collective, which was a bakery and a brewery in one space. And at that stage, in, in my real life, I was just starting to think about setting up a brewery, and now, six years later, I'm setting up a, we have a brewery, and it's going to move into the same building as a bakery. Because we played it, and it was like, this feels really good, I'm going to do this. And it created a longing in me to make that a reality. So making space for play and making play a part of this change is really important. Oh, God. Um, what if we consider... Yeah, okay. So we all know what that means. So, so there is something about... The, one of the things, when I set out researching this book about imagination, there were lots of things I didn't know about. This is a piece of our brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus kind of sits in the middle of our brain. And whenever we're being imaginative, whatever the networks are that fire when we're being imaginative, they all have the hippocampus at the middle of it. And the thing with the hippocampus is that it is the part of our brain that is uniquely susceptible to fear and anxiety and cortisol. So when people are, have trauma, when people uh, are very uh, depressed, the hippocampus shrinks. And when the hippocampus shrinks, we become less able to see the future, we become just stuck in the present, we seek out negative stories that confirm our negative uh, visions of the future. And actually, we live in a time, I think, when our hippocampus is under a fairly unprecedented level of, of, uh, of, of pressure. This is an amazing woman called, called, called Rosalie Summerton in Dundee in Scotland. And she runs a project called Art Angel. And Art Angel works with people who are experiencing depression and anxiety and mental health problems. But, so when you go to Art Angel, you're not a client, you're not a patient, you're an artist. As soon as you walk through the door, you are an artist who is preparing work for an exhibition and they help you with paints and pens and tea and biscuits and, uh, and support if you need support. 
It's one of the most incredible projects. And what I saw there was people who were learning to be imaginative again. They were learning to observe the world around them again. And they were learning to think about the future again in a way that they hadn't been able to do before. It was really, really powerful. And every year they do a thing where they ask the people who work with them, what impact has this made on your life? What was, what was, how would you compare yourself before you came here and before you came uh, and afterwards? And people would make an image of it. And this was, this was one of them which really sums up the impact that that place has on people, before and after. And it really made me think. You know, I, I spoke to, to the guy who was the director there. He said, fundamentally, this place is about safety and hope. Safety and hope which makes me feel that in the work we're doing in transition, there's such important things that we need to be creating for people. This is a woman called Donna Rose Addis, who's a neuroscientist, who I spoke to about all of this thing of, of, of actually, when we become more anxious, when we become more stressed, how does it impact our imagination? And she said to me, uh, anxiety has an important relationship to imagination because it can lead us into a position where we're focusing on negati imagining negative future outcomes that may further cause us to become even more anxious. So another thing that's happening is that we, is, is that's impacting our imagination, I think, is that we spend less and less time in nature, less and less time outside. One of the things that I did on, when I was researching this was went on an event where we all woke up at four o'clock in the morning and went to listen to all the birds starting to sing. It's not something I'd really done before, but I really recommend it in April or May, get up early, go to a place where there's trees, and provided for you completely free of charge will be the most extraordinary concert that you've ever had the privilege, better than anything you'd ever go to listen to in a, in a, in a concert hall. And, uh, but we don't do that enough, and it makes such a difference, I think. This is uh, uh, John Muir, the very famous ecologist, and uh, President Roosevelt. And President Roosevelt was a big fan of John Muir. He read all of his books, and he said, I, one day I'd really like to go camping with John Muir. And so they went to the Yosemite Park, just the two of them, with a couple of other people, and they, went, they spent three or four days just wandering around and camping in different places and staying up late around the campfire and having long conversations about why wilderness matters, why nature matters. And after that, uh, President Roosevelt passed the biggest legislation creating hundreds of national parks and national forests. And, and he said when he died, that, uh, that one, well, obviously not when he died, before he died, he said that one of the most, uh, one of the most important things he did in his life was go camping. Uh, with John Muir. And so for me, there's something, I have a big long list of people who I would like to take camping, uh, uh, important people in the world who I think it would make a big difference to. And when we live in a world where the amount of diversity that we share the world with is shrinking, I think that also has an impact on our imagination. René Dubot used to say, if we lived on the moon, our imagination would be as barren as the moon. If we live in a world where the diversity around us is shrinking, then our, diverse, then our imagination shrinks with it. And if we live in a world where we know that that is happening, so in my lifetime, the amount of creatures that we share this planet with has fallen by 60% during my lifetime, that when we live in a world where that is happening, people talk about that we live in a time of pre-traumatic stress disorder, that we know something is happening, and the anxiety of living knowing that's happening again, is, is, un, is undermining our ability to be imaginative, is eroding uh, our imagination. This is an amazing project in London called the London National Park, which was created by a geographer who took his son to visit all the national parks in the UK, and then came back to London and said, looked at a map of London and said, actually, 47.5% of London is green space, and 2% of London is blue space, rivers and lakes, so we only need another half a percent, and then London is a, is, is, is a national park. And that's one square meter for every person in London. We can do that, surely. And it's a beautiful what-if question. I'll talk a bit more about what-if questions in a minute. But the, 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 this project is, is beautiful, and this is the map that they created. So this is London without any buildings. This is London as a national park. So it's a beautiful question because it invites people to say, ah, yeah, we could do that. We could, we could turn our playground into a, in, into a garden. We could do, you know, everybody has a role to play 
in making that happen. And I think if we live in a city which is a national park, it's so much more of an invitation for us to be imaginative than if we live in a city that isn't. This is one of my heroes. This is a woman called Daria Robinson. And Daria Robinson lives in Richmond in California, uh, which is a neighborhood, which is a very poor neighborhood, uh, about 84% black, very, very poor, lots of gangs, things like that. And she, uh, she grew up there, it's her place, and she is a, an urban agriculture activist. She created a project called Urban Tilth, which trains young men uh, to become urban farmers and has trained many, many people now. They have 13 food gardens and farms now throughout Richmond, and, uh, and she's just absolutely amazing. And they live in the shadow of an enormous Chevron oil refinery, and one year the refinery exploded and covered all of their gardens in black, toxic soot. And when Chevron held a public meeting in a hall like this to say, sorry, uh, all of the young people brought all of the harvest that had been lost and put it all on the stage in front of the, uh, the, the people from Chevron while they were, while they were speaking. But what, they've, what, what she's found is that when you work with people and, and reconnect them to nature and get their hands uh, into the soil, that it really starts to change people's sense of what's possible. And when I spoke to her, she said, um, I've heard it straight from youth in our program and people in the city now. They have a distinctly different outlook than folks that were growing up when I was growing up. A lot of the people who grew up in my generation were just trying to get out. You don't want to die here. You're just going to die if you stay here, you know? To make it out, that was the goal. Now I hear a lot more people saying, I want to live here. I want to be able to afford to buy a house here and make my life here. They're dreaming out all kinds of other new things and feeling like it's totally within the realm of possibility. They can be their own community developers. They can start these different businesses. There's a lot more people getting involved in politics. There's a lot more people with imaginative ideas. They want to start things like new nonprofits and starting other, and other, and other things starting up. Because when you, when you bring the, the, the nature back in and build that relationship, uh, everything feels much more possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Attention. It's very hard to be imaginative if, you, if, 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 you don't have, if your attention span is, is in pieces. Do you know, this is a, a, a William Wordsworth, who's a very famous uh, English poet who wrote a poem about daffodils. Does that? It's probably, no, anyway. So anyway, there's a very famous poem in English about daffodils where this man and his sister in 1803 or 1810 went for a walk around this lake and they saw these beautiful daffodils and they wrote a poem about it, which is still now one of the most famous poems in English. Daffodils. And, um, and it made me wonder, actually, nowadays, if they had gone for that same walk and they had their iPhones and they were walking along and maybe they were, you know, checking their Facebook, uh, you know, take, putting some pictures on Instagram or checking their emails maybe or, you know, checking the football results on the, on, on the phone. Whether they would have even seen the daffodils. You know, we live in a time where our, where our attention is under incredible pressure. And if we can't, if we have no attention, it's very, very hard to be imaginative, I think. You know, we now, it is now said that we have less of an attention span than goldfish. Huh? And this is a woman called Sherry Turkle who wrote a book. She said, we are forever elsewhere. You know, our relationship with these technologies mean that our ability to, to, to sustain thought. You know, when I started writing this book, I, I, when I was younger, I used to read big books. And then actually, and then I've spent the last five or six years working for Transition Network, writing blogs and putting the blogs on Facebook and putting the blogs on Twitter and res responding to things on Twitter and then going back to Facebook and then going back to my email and then going back to Facebook and then going to YouTube and then going back to Facebook and then going to Twitter. And actually, when I sat down to read books again, I couldn't read a book for more than about four minutes, five minutes, for that little bit in your brain starts going, oh, uh, oh. You just maybe you should just check your email. 
And when we can't sustain our attention, uh, I don't know, is that, is that anybody else's experience as well? Yeah, it's, it, if, it's, it's, it's the, the erosion of our attention. But it's important to say that your attention span is not disappearing just by some natural process. Our attention span is being stolen by very, very powerful uh, companies and designers. Every time you look on the screen behind there are thousands of very smart designers who want your attention span. And, uh, and, and we're powerless to resist it often. And we don't tolerate boredom anymore. You know, boredom is, is really, somebody, as somebody said, uh, boredom can be recognized as your imagination calling you. If every time when we would otherwise be bored and look out of the window and go for a walk and dream, we fill that time with our phones and our Facebook and scrolling through different things, then where is the space for our imagination? Where is the space anymore for, for, for dreaming? And somebody put it really beautifully a while ago. They said, so, so all of those platforms that we use every day, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what is, their in, what is their intention for your life for the next five years? If you think, you know, what do I want to achieve over the next five years? Maybe I want to go traveling. I want to write a book. I want to finish my master's thing. I want to train to be a teacher. I want to, whatever it is that you in your, in your heart desire, in the next five years, I want to do that. The desire of those platforms is completely different. Their aim for your next five years is for you to spend as much of your time focusing on those platforms as you possibly can. So somebody a while ago said, it's like if you buy a sat-nav for your, for your car and you say, take me to Brussels, and you end up in Paris, you'd say, this is terrible. But actually, all of the time, those things are taking us away from what it is that we want to do. They're hijacking our attention and taking us away from where we want to be. And so we sometimes think, well, we're just too busy these days. We're so busy, we don't have time for doing transition or reading books or things like that. So the average, if somebody calculated recently that to read 200 books a year at the average reading speed would take about 450 hours. We spend about 680 hours a year on Facebook and about 1,600 hours watching the television. You know, do we really not have enough time? School. This is a, a, an artist in England who says all schools should be art schools. You know, what we're seeing in education, I think, is, is, is the erosion of, 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 of imagination. And uh, the, the, certainly in the UK, I don't know about here, but we're seeing arts being driven out of schools. Less and less time for arts. It's all about results. It's all about maths and English and, and science. And we don't need art. Get, get rid of the art. We don't need art in schools. This is uh, something. So I was looking around thinking, well, where are there education systems that really foster imagination? that that's their main aim, is to make people really imaginative. This is in Italy, in a place called Reggio Emilia, where they have an amazing system of education. So at the end of the Second World War, all that all the, the, the town had left was one German tank, six trucks, and three horses. And so they sold them all, and they used the money to build a school with the express idea that we're going to build a school which has a system of education that will ensure that fascism never happens again. And one of the key things with that was the idea that at the heart of every school is a workshop. And at any time of day, you can go and someone will help you make stuff. An atelier, they call them atelier. And you can go at any time of day, there is somebody there uh, who will help you. And their whole philosophy is that children are beautiful, powerful, competent, creative, curious, and full of potential and ambitious desires and authors of their own learning. So there are no classes, it's all based on projects, on what you're interested in, and the school is there to help uh, and support. And it's inspired lots of other places. This is in Brazil, in a very poor neighborhood in Brazil, where they've built this school which is based around a circus, a circus tent. And uh, it's called Project Ancora, and it's the same idea that you don't have classes, you design your own learning, and the teachers really help, and there's lots of space for play and for imagination. And this is some people who go into schools in the UK and get the children to take them for walks in places to see them how children see them. And then they make these maps of actually how the children see the spaces. 
Inside the tree there is a bug. Inside the blood there is life. These beautiful maps that are made of how the kids see the world. This is a, a local giant who uses a skipping rope. Uh, a rainbow is a skipping rope. The tree land of mythical. This is a school in Denmark called the Green Folk School where, again, it's, there's no classes. It's all about projects. It's about making things with your hands, uh, lots of stories, uh, going outside into nature. And this is a school near where I live in, in, in Plymouth, which is a, a school funded by the government, which is based on the idea that all schools should be art schools. And originally, they wanted to put the school into an empty department store, a big department store, and they couldn't. So their brief to the architect was, design us a department store that we can make a school in. And they said to, they said to the architect, it needs, to, it, uh, it needs to have no corridors, it needs to have no rooms that resemble a prison cell designed for 30 inmates. It needs specialist performance and studio spaces. You know, and it's the most amazing place. And again, they, they, they run the whole place like an art school uh, with no classrooms, it's just studios and people working together. So for me, it feels like actually, it's not to say that this school will solve climate change, but it will make it a lot easier to solve climate change when a lot of people go to schools like this, or when our schools become more like this. Stories, yes. So um, I think one of the things with, with that we need to become really, really great storytellers. I'm really good at telling stories. This is a, a, a lemon, obviously. This is some, some people I met who were, who were uh, scientists in, in my university near where I live, who had done this research where they, they, they say to people, okay, imagine a lemon. Imagine you're holding a lemon in your hand and you throw the lemon up and then you catch the lemon in your hand and you can sort of feel, you can feel the weight of it and it feels cool. Uh, maybe then you cut the lemon in half and you squeeze it into a glass and you can smell the juice and you maybe a bit squirts in your eye. And, uh, uh, and they use this to help people to see that imagination is a multi-sensory thing. We imagine smell, we imagine feeling, we imagine all of these things. And so they work with people who have um, addiction and who are overweight, and uh, they say, they help them to imagine what life would be like when they've lost weight, when they're healthy. But to imagine it in a really multi-sensory way. Imagine you're out running and you can hear the bird song and you're running by the river. What do you see? What does it smell like? Imagine the first time you're able to actually bend down and play with your grandchildren because, because you've lost enough weight to do that. What does that feel like? What would you be hearing when that happens? And you build this really powerful picture of what it could be like. So then when someone offers you a cake, no, I'm not interested. I'm going there. That's where I'm going. And they've had incredible results with it. It's been really, really successful. Those drawings that I showed you at the beginning of the future, they were drawn by this man here called James Mackay. And he, does a, he creates graphic novels of the future. And sometimes he goes out into a place and he starts to draw that place, but like it might be in the future. And as people walk past, he asks them to contribute and to give their ideas uh, about how it could be. Uh, it's really powerful. He says, he says, if you want to start a conversation with someone about how the future could be, you draw a sketch. You start with a sketch, even simple. And then that, that creates something you can then uh, build the conversation around. This is uh, one of my very favorite illustrators in the world, a man called Quentin Blake. And uh, I saw him show these pictures, and they moved me very, very much. He, so when we're talking about this drawing the future, it's not always literal. Sometimes we can draw what it feels like. And he was commissioned by, in Angers, in France, to design murals in a maternity hospital. So that when you arrive, these are the first pictures that you see. So he says, he describes them as a celebration of what's going to happen and a reassurance that that is what will happen. And for me, as somebody who had, has four children who were all born in water, when I saw these pictures, I thought they were just the most beautiful, beautiful things. And uh, he, uh, so he, he talked about a meeting he has, he had with the, with the officials at the hospital who said, there's one, imp the most important thing about these pictures, he thought, oh no, they're going to say we've run out of money or we can't do them anymore. And the administrator said the most important thing is the exchange, the look between the mother uh, and the child. And I think they're absolutely beautiful.
you know, so how, how can we create, again, those that give us that sense of what the future can be like? It's not necessarily literal, but it gives us that sort of emotional taste of it. This is a man called Mohsin Hamid, who's a, who's a writer, uh, a, a novelist. And one of the things I think we need to be really getting good at is telling stories of the future, of the, of the future that turned out okay. I don't mean utopia. I don't mean like some amazing thing where everything is perfect and we go to the moon on holiday and uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the, if we get through the next 20 or 30 years in a way that, that we do what needs to be done and we get to the other side and it's okay, how do we tell the stories about that? And he wrote a book called East West, which is about a couple who live in Syria and who leave Syria when the, when the war gets really bad. And suddenly these magical doors start to appear in the city. And when you walk through the door, you kind of magically appear somewhere else in the world. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a way by which people just move around the world to different places. So it invites us to imagine what would the world be like if there was free movement and people could move and get away from dangerous places and settle in other places? And he has a beautiful little bit of writing where he talks about uh, 20 or 30 years in the future what, it's, what it was like. He says, the apocalypse appeared to have arrived and yet it was not apocalyptic, which is to say that while the changes were jarring, they were not the end and life went on and people found things to do and people to be with, and plausible, desirable futures began to emerge, unimaginable previously, but not unimaginable now, and the result was something not unlike relief. So, how do we, as people, in the communities where we are, doing transition or not doing transition, start this process of, of a great reimagining? So, I want to tell you some what-if stories. So, so where, where a community has come together around a big what-if question. So this is in London, in a place called Tooting, where the transition group uh, created this event called the Tooting Twirl. So a twirl is where something sort of, like a twirl, like that. Uh, because in Tooting they have a big street and they have nowhere that's like a public space or a village green or a town centre or a place like that. So they said, what, there, but there is one place where it could be, which is here, which is uh, a place that is normally full of buses. This is where all the buses wait uh, to be called off somewhere else. So the air quality is terrible. This is not a nice place. But they said, that, could be, that should be our space. So they spent a day where they said, what if that space were our community space? And the buses went away. The buses went elsewhere. And they filled the space with music and food. They put grass on the ground so that you could uh, experience the green, green grass of tooting. There was coffee and music and dancing. I got to take my shoes and socks off uh, on a hot summer's day in London and put, it, put them on the grass. And what was really interesting, spending the day there, was that people's conversations went from if this was our community space, to when this is our community space, what will we do? The whole story started to shift and how people saw that space started to shift. And this is a, a wall of a big shop. No one ever looks at that wall normally. But that day, everybody sat there and looked at that wall and said, when this is our community space, what will we paint on that wall? What story will we tell about our community and its dreams and its desires uh, where on, on that wall? It was really, really beautiful. So there's something very powerful about saying, we're not, gonna, we're not asking anybody's permission. We're going to go. It's like Greta Thunberg, the amazing 16-year-old uh, uh, climate activist who went to the United Nations and said, I'm not here to ask you to do anything. I'm just telling you it's already happening. You know, it feels like that. You know, actually with events like this, we just start to make the change and, and people live that and experience that. This is a couple called Dan and Hillary. And Dan and Hillary live in a, a neighborhood in London with uh, a lot of the impacts of, of austerity that the government has imposed on people. And I think if you look at austerity, that process of closing the libraries and cutting the funding for the arts and creating very high levels of anxiety, actually what austerity is, is a war on the imagination, is a direct assault 
uh, on a people's imagination at exactly the wrong time in history to be doing something like that. So they're looking around in their community and saying, how can we help? We have very high levels of debt. He's a filmmaker, she's a printmaker. What can we do? So the bank in their street closed. And they said, OK, we're going to take, take the bank. We'll, we'll have the bank, but we'll turn it into a different kind of a bank. We're going to turn it into what they called an act of citizen money creation. And so they started to print these notes. Uh, and they hung them up to dry on, like, on washing lines throughout the building. And they have different denominations of these notes. So on these notes, this is not a local currency. This is like collectible artwork. So the idea is that, is, is that you buy these. And, then it, uh, and so the, these people all are the main uh, people in the community who are stepping in to help people because of austerity. So these guys here run a project that keeps young, young men out of gangs. This is the woman who is the principal at the local primary school who have lost all of their funding for the arts. This guy here mortgaged his house in order to raise the money to start a food bank because he could see the, the scale of hunger in his community. And this family here, uh, they run um, a kitchen where they feed uh, about 250 people three meals a day every day of the year from money that they just raise in donations. These are, these are the heroes of the community, not the queen, uh, to be putting on our currencies. So the idea is that they want to sell these to raise 50,000 pounds. And half of that 50,000 pounds will be divided between these four charities. And then the other half they will use to take to the secondary debt market, where debt is bought and sold. And they have just bought, for 25,000 pounds, 1.2 million pounds worth of, of lending of, of debt from this community, which they are then just cancelling the debt. It's the most fantastic, fantastic project. I didn't know anything about this whole market where people buy and sell debt. If you have a debt and you don't pay it back, then often it's sold to another company for as little as 2% of the value of that debt. And they might sell it onto another company, onto another company. So they buy that debt and they've, they've cancelled the debt. It's a beautiful project. This is in Liège. Uh, which is another beautiful what-if question, where they, uh, about five years ago, started to say, what if, in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? What a beautiful question. Because it's a question that invites so many people to step in and say, I've got a piece of that. I can grow mushrooms. I want to do this. I want to do that. Within that big story, so I went there five years ago where this was just an idea. And they presented this idea at a big event and chefs came and food academics and farmers and baristas and anyone who cared about food came. And then I didn't hear anything for about four years. And I went back again last year. And in that time, they had created 21 new cooperatives. They had raised 5 million euros from local people. I met the mayor of the city who said to me, um, we used to say we wanted to be a, a smart city, now we want to be a transition city. And all the land that we own as a municipality, we're making available for young people who want to start growing food to support this project. Whoop. This is uh, Pascal Hennen here, who runs the, the Petit Producteur, which is one of three shops they now run in the city. And, uh, and uh, I spoke to him and he said, I said, how, how far can this go? How, how big can this get? How important is this? And he said, I think by the time we have 15 shops, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. It's a beautiful word you have in French, eh? fragiliser. We don't have it in English, but it's, it kind of works in English as well. The supermarkets will start to fragiliser. Not because we campaigned against supermarkets, but because we built something better and we built something that met our needs better and the food was better and the celebrations were better and the shops were better. This is the, uh, the brewery that I had, I had to go and visit. <laughs> we all have to make sacrifices for these movements, you know. And they created two new vineyards and they have a farm and you start to see what it looks like when all of this uh, starts to come together. And uh, uh, I said to, to, to Christian Jeunet, who runs this, I said, why does this work? 
why, why are people so excited about this and, and, and investing money in it? He said, because we had a strong narrative. We had a strong story. And people wanted to, to see it happening. And this is, for me, is one of the most beautiful what-if questions because you see how it unlocks uh, possibility. This is a man called uh, Kali Akuno in Jackson, in, in Mississippi, which is a very, very poor city, uh, experiences a lot of racism, uh, a lot of, um, uh, sort of neglect from the wider state. They're, they are, uh, through an organization called Cooperation Jackson, they are transforming the economy uh, of Jackson through what-if questions. The whole movement there is based on 10 what-if questions, which I can't now remember, but there are 10 what-if questions that are underpinning everything, everything that they do. And again, it's unlocking a kind of creativity that a sort of neoliberal economic model just really, really doesn't do. And he, did I say what he was going to say to me? Oh yeah, he said to me, and this I thought was really wonderful in the context of uh, when we think about, well maybe if we talk about collapse all the time, we might inspire people to get involved in changing the world, which I don't believe myself. And he said, wallowing in a defeatist attitude is a sure way to be defeated. Stay grounded and utilize what opportunities and strengths you have. We are never completely out of it unless we surrender. So what would it look like if we elected people who, who wanted to really help the imagination? You know, I think there's a difference between imagination and innovation. Every government is elected and says, we have a national innovation strategy. They never say, we have a national imagination strategy. But innovation and imagination are very different. I like to think of it in terms of pizza. So pizza, you don't really, pizza, you can innovate with pizza because the fundamental model of pizza really works. You know, we all understand pizza and we can innovate with pizza with new toppings and interesting flour and stuff, but the basic model of pizza works. The basic model of growth-based neoliberal economics doesn't work. It's not like pizza. When the fundamental model doesn't work, you have to reimagine. You have to bring the imagination to the fore, which is not what's happening at the moment. So you might have heard in the UK that we made a fairly monumentally spectacular mistake about two years ago. <laughs> and a million people today in London came out in the streets. The biggest demonstration in the history of the UK came out today. I'm so excited and said, no, stop it, this is just stupid. Uh, and, um, but that, that model of having a referendum that takes a really complicated issue and says, what do you think, yes or no, has been so deeply divisive and so ruinous to the national imagination in, in the UK. The last three years, you can't talk about anything apart from Brexit. You can't propose any ideas apart from Brexit. Government can't think about anything apart from Brexit. It's been absolutely destructive to the collective imagination. In Ireland, they do things a bit better in Ireland. When they have a big decision to make, like uh, should we legalize abortion, should we allow uh, gay marriage, they had a citizens' assembly. And a citizens' assembly allows that idea to be digested and deliberated and mature, informed debate to happen. And they had those referendums without that toxic divisiveness that we see in the UK where families and communities don't speak to each other anymore. Because if we want to have a democracy that enables us to see things as if they could be otherwise, we need to do democracy differently because at the moment it doesn't work. This is in Barcelona where they have the most amazing revolution going on in terms of democracy with what's called the municipalist movement where they have neighborhood assemblies in all of the neighborhoods across Barcelona who discuss ideas and give those ideas to the city government and it shapes a really radical uh, reimagining of politics in Barcelona. And we need the economic models as well. This is in, in the city of Preston where they're doing transition on a big scale. So the city, uh, the city in Preston in 2011, the economy was just finished. They had planned to do that model of development where you build a big, big shopping center, and it didn't work. So they had no other ideas. So they brought together all of the main organizations that spend public money, and they said, where does all the money go? Every year you spend 750 million pounds. Where does it go? 
And they found that only 4% of it was spent into the economy of the city and all the rest of it left. So they changed the whole way the economy worked. They now call it the Preston model, where they create cooperatives and they create as many ways as possible for that money to circulate. They are creating the framework, the space within which the imagination is invited uh, to flourish and for extraordinary things to happen. This could happen absolutely anywhere. One of the things I found out about when I was researching the book was that in Mexico City, the mayor of Mexico City has uh, a ministry of imagination within the administration. This woman here is called Gabriela Gomez Mont, and she runs the Ministry of Imagination. And the Ministry of Imagination, the average age of people who work at the Ministry of Imagination is 29. And they are a mixture of the kind of people like planners and people like that, but also artists and poets and all kinds of creative people as well. And when I spoke to her, she said, imagination is not a luxury. We should not only be thinking about building cities for the human body, but also for the human imagination. The more we distribute the capacity to imagine different futures, the better off we will be. And their work is about working within the government to, to, to make sure that, that, that it is as imaginative as it could possibly be. And this is in Bologna, where the municipality in Bologna have what's called the Civic Imagination Office. And the Civic Imagination Office sits between the people and the municipality. And most of you were at the open space, have done, have done open space today at some point, I think. So they do, they, they do big open space events regularly. They help the community to develop projects. They support them to develop their projects. It's the most fantastic thing. And I said to the guy who runs it, why do you call it the Civic Imagination Office? Why not just call it the Civic Engagement Office or the Civic Support Office? And he said, uh, he said in the beginning, I was very skeptical about using it because I thought we needed a very practical approach to people's problems, needs, and capacity. But after two years of work on the ground, I have learned that imagine is one of the most used words in all of our events. People want to imagine new ways to solve problems. Imagine is a very simple word. Everybody understands what it is. It's a clever way to speak about how to solve problems in a new way. And then I was wonder, well, what would it be like if we had a National Imagination Act? If we elected governments who said, we are going to put the imagination at the forefront of everything, at education, of public life, of policy making. Every policy we make we should be looked at through the lens of, does this make this country more imaginative or less imaginative? Does it create the ideal conditions for imagination or does it not? And in Wales, they've created a thing called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act which is a piece of legislation which would be a beautiful uh, uh, thing that you could base an imagination act on, which basically invites every public organization to say how they're going to maximize the well-being of future generations. And you could do the same thing uh, for imagination very easily, I think. And it would mean that if you had something like that, when the government said we're going to impose austerity, you could say you can't do that, because that, that runs against the National Imagination Act. You're not allowed to do that. So is my very last question, what if all of this happened? What if we lived in a world where that had happened? If our daily experience was that we lived in cities where our imagination was really uh, encouraged, so that our everyday experience, we were invited to play and tell stories and help to reimagine what the future would be like. It was a time when uh, people... Uh, considered it as, as, as a time where imagination really, really flourished. What would that be like? This is a th uh, one day in London in 2006. People woke up, and this is a place called Waterloo Street. And in Waterloo Street, there was this had appeared overnight. It looked like a, a rocket had landed from outer space. And the, 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 the street was all smashed, and there was smoke coming out of it and the police had put a, a ring around it to keep people away. And people, what on earth is that? And nobody knew what that was. And the police said, oh, we don't know what it is. Uh, and it stayed there all day. And more and more people came and said, what is that? What is going on here? And it was in the news. 
people don't know well, something happened in London and no one knows what it is. The next morning, they opened the lid of the rocket and out of the rocket came this girl, this puppet of this girl who was uh, a sort of an eight-year-old. People said she was like everyone's daughter. And she went for a walk around the city and she would pick children up and look them in the eyes like this. And then the next day, this elephant arrived. It's called the Sultan's Elephant. And the elephant and the girl met each other in the park. And the story was that the, the elephant traveled through space and time uh, to find the girl and that they had met up in London. And, uh, and this lasted for the weekend. So in the, in the nighttime, the girl slept in a massive deck chair in front of Buckingham Palace. And uh, people, about a million people came out to come and see this and were really, really moved by it. And, uh, and then at the end of it, the girl went and got back in the rocket and there was a whole load of smoke and then the girl had disappeared. And when you watch the film of it, people are in floods of tears. It was the most magical thing that happened in London for, for a very, very long time. And I love that idea of something that just arrives overnight. That a place that you know really, really well, your local train station, your local school, uh, a place that you walk past every day overnight is transformed into something uh, unexpected and something imaginative. This is a man called Jason Roberts, the man at the front, who runs a project in America called the Better, Better Block. And they go to spaces that nobody loves, and they, and they transform them into something else. He says, uh, in most places, there are lots of rules to say all the things you can't do. So we go and we break all the rules. And we paint our own cycle lanes, and we plant trees, and we make shops, and we, and we just transform that space. This is a space that they went to uh, that was a kind of unloved corner of, of that particular area. And two days later, it looked like this. How can we do use that kind of element of surprise to transform places like we did with our cardboard box town so that overnight people get a, get a real sense of that so we get to live in the future. We can create those kind of tastes uh, of what the future could be like. This is an amazing project thing that they do every year called Parking Day. So if you are an artist, if there are any artists here and you want a space in which to have an exhibition or to show your work in some way or another, to rent space in a gallery is quite expensive. But actually, car parking spaces might cost you like five euros for the day. Uh, so you just buy a ticket and it's your space. <laughs> you can do whatever you like in that space. You could make a little yoga studio in there and people could come and join you and do yoga all day. You could just make it a place where you could play board games or whoever happens to be walking past. You could do whatever that is. I've got no idea quite what that is. No, but again, it's that idea that something just arises that people don't expect, and then it goes again. And I'm really kind of taken with this idea of how do we, uh, how, how do we bring the imagination to places? Because, uh, you know, and when there is a big student strike or a big climate march, could we use all those people to go to a place and transform that place? and leave it like that, and you build the gardens, and you plant the trees, and you make the kind of future that we need to see. I was really interested in that question I mentioned earlier of, if we lived in a time when imagination flourished, what would it feel like? I can't quite imagine it, because I've not lived in a time when it felt like imagination was really, 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 really invited and cherished and was happening everywhere. But the year that I was born, in Paris, when they had the, 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 the revolution in Paris in May 1968. And for two months, the students kind of took control of parts of the city and they took, occupied their universities and they turned the printing studios into these ateliers populaires where they printed hundreds of posters every day which are now worth lots and lots of money. But at the time, they were printing all these posters and putting them out. Uh, and I was really interested to know what did it feel like for people who were there at that time? What did it feel like to be part of a revolution that was really based... People used to say things, write the graffiti like, be realistic, demand the impossible. And imagination taking power, power to the imagination, imagination taking power. So I found some really lovely kind of uh, oral histories where people talked about what it felt like to be in those times. But they said, Paris was wonderful then. Everyone was talking. 
It was fantastic. May was like that, living on a constant high. Life was beautiful. The weather was lovely. Everything we did immediately belonged to history. All the hierarchies suddenly dissolved. Another person said, in that month of talking, a month of talking, wouldn't that be nice? In the month of talking, mind you, I feel like I've done a month of talking just in this one day, actually. Um, another said, in that month of talking, you learnt more than in the whole of your five years studying. Learnt because you could talk to anyone and everyone. It really was another world, a dream world perhaps, but that's what I'll always remember, the need and the right for everyone to speak. That's what I'd like the next 15, 10, 15, 20 years to feel like. And actually, as transition groups, there's a huge amount that we can do to start to create and hold the spaces where it can feel like that. So I want to finish with this photograph. Because I uh, was in France a little while ago, in Lyon, and driving in a car through Lyon one evening. And I looked out of the window, and I saw that, and I took a photograph. And maybe the lights are too bright, you can't quite see. But this is, uh, this is just a, a bin, a dustbin, and a concrete bollard on a street in Lyon. But to me, this, someone has just put a dot and a, and a line there. And to me, that has completely transformed that space. To me, it looks like the, the, the concrete bollard and the bin are in love with each other. They are lovers underneath the most beautiful starry sky. They are leaning into each other. I think if the bin could purr like a cat, it would be purring like that. And that's just because somebody has put two dots and a line on a piece of concrete. You know, if, if we want to enable people to imagine spaces in different ways, we don't need to spend millions of pounds uh, to transform them. We can do simple little things that shift how we look and how we see the possibilities of that space. So for me, it's, it's fundamentally this idea that if we want to... Uh, uh, enable people to see things as if they could be otherwise. That's the most important work we have over the next five or ten years. And we do that by creating, by starting to live as though that change has already happened. Uh, and a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation uh, at a college near my house. And then a few days later, I went on the student march in, uh, in my nearby city. And, the, the, and there was this magical moment where the main demonstration of about a thousand kids were standing there and then they all looked over to the side and there was another group of about 400 kids who had walked up from the city who came up to join them. And as, they, as the two groups joined, they kind of cheered each other, hooray, as they all came together. And as the group came in at the very back, I saw this banner, what if? And, uh, and it was the group of students that I had taught about three days ago who had then sat and thought, How, what, what can we take to the, to the march? And they had created just this banner that just said, what if, on it. And, uh, and, it was, and it felt like a very powerful moment to me. If we can bring in to these movements the space to ask what if, then I think we have something very exciting happening. So that's me, and thank you for your attention. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so we have some time. Do you, shall, I, do, shall I ask questions? Do you? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Petite proposition, on va avoir un temps de questions et réponses de la salle envers Rob. Juste avant ça, ce que je vous propose de faire, c'est de vous retourner, comme vous l'avez fait déjà tout à l'heure, vers la même personne ou une autre personne que vous peut-être vous ne connaissez pas encore, et d'avoir quelques instants d'échange sur qu'est-ce que vous avez pensé de ce moment, qu'est-ce que ça vous a inspiré, euh, de quoi ça, à quoi ça vous donne envie. Voilà.
Je vous propose donc de profiter-en, profiter de ce moment. Euh, et je vous ferai signe comme ça quand ce sera tout. Merci, merci. Je suis désolé de vous interrompre. Voilà. Je propose qu'on passe à la, à la suite. Avec, on va arriver aux, aux questions et réponses à, à Rob. Euh, je dois donner deux, trois petites informations avant. Après le temps de questions et réponses, il y aura un bar qui sera tenu en bas avec des, des bières et des jus de fruits et de l'eau de la région locale. Euh, si vous avez euh, un casque, euh, on n'a pas demandé de caution, euh, mais les, ça coûte assez cher, donc on vous demande de, 
l'organisation de l'université s'est dit on va faire confiance à cette audience, les personnes vont leur apporter en bon état pour qu'on n'ait pas à aller les chercher entre les bancs, euh, etc. Donc on vous fait confiance quand vous sortez de la salle, si vous avez un casque, allez le, le rendre au même endroit, c'est important. Euh, je dois donner l'information aussi qu'à 11h on devra avoir quitté le bâtiment parce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui va venir fermer, l'alarme va s'allumer, tout ça, sinon il faut rester jusque, jusque lundi matin. Euh, Qu'est-ce que je dois encore dire avant les questions et réponses <rire> euh, voilà. Et je voulais encore remercier une fois l'université de Mons de nous avoir accueillis ce soir, et notamment Baptiste, qui a, qui a beaucoup fait pour l'organisation au niveau, au niveau de l'université. Et puis on va passer aux questions et réponses. Et euh, peut-être vous avez déjà vécu ce type de conférence euh, au niveau du mouvement de la transition, mais parfois dans les conférences, quand on, on rentre dans le tour de questions et réponses, il y a certaines personnes qui osent poser des questions, et d'autres moins. Et souvent, il euh, y a plus d'hommes qui posent des questions que de femmes, et souvent c'est des hommes plus âgés. Et ici, on va procéder un peu différemment, c'est-à-dire qu'on va prendre une question d'une femme, puis d'un homme, puis d'une femme, puis d'un homme, et on va voir ce que ça va donner au niveau de, de ce moment passé tous ensemble, de proposer un peu de parité. Et Rob me rappelle de dire que si vous ne vous définissez ni comme un homme ni comme une femme, vous pouvez aussi poser une question. Là-bas Allez-y. Il euh, y a des micros en fait euh, qui sont sur les côtés. Il y en a un là, un là, un là, un là. Ici, là, madame là. Plusieurs peuvent lever la main, comme ça vous recevez le micro à l'avant si on perd un peu moins de temps. Madame là-bas. One, two, one, two. Good evening. Uh, uh, I'm going to count for non-binary so that uh, another woman can have a... <laughs> alors, alors en fait, Rob a un casque qui peut lui permettre qu'on lui traduise les questions en français. Comme ça, ceux qui ne comprennent pas l'anglais comprennent la question aussi si vous parlez en français. Donc si tout le monde est OK avec ça, de poser la question en français, Rob reçoit la traduction et comme ça, toute l'audience comprend la question. Ok, et si lundi, euh, à mes étudiants ingénieurs, je dis euh, qu'est-ce que vous allez planifier pour les trois prochaines années au niveau de la transition Vers quoi est-ce que je dois les lancer C'est une grande question. Vous savez, know, What if, every, not just engineering, but what if every course did that? What, what would it look like if a university declared a climate emergency? And they said, actually, uh, this is a climate emergency now. Uh, you know, in the same way that if, if there was a war, the university would change what it does uh, because there's a war and we have to, we have to respond to that. If, if the university declared a climate emergency, it was so interesting today at the, um, actually, where's my bag? Hang on, Joshua? Je suis. Je suis. Can you just get past me my bag? So today in the open space, the, 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 the young people's open space, there was, thank you, there was a, um, there was a, a board where they asked, where they asked uh, young people what sh subjects should be taught in school. And they were so brilliant, the answers were so brilliant, I wrote them all down. So this is what the young people thought should happen in school. Uh, we should learn how to move instead of sitting down. We should learn how to show our emotions. We should play all day long. We should think about the future. We should know how to be ourselves. We should learn beekeeping, ecology. We should be taught disobedience in school. That was my favorite one. Imagine, okay, kids, now it's time for disobedience class. Um, we should have fun, laughter. Uh, there should, it should be a school in the forest. We should use the five senses. We should learn how to have confidence in ourselves and in other people. We should learn serenity and naughty things. We should learn conscience, awareness, and how to look after... I don't know what that says. Anyway... No, but actually, I thought, that's what I would have liked to have got out of school. So when I was a teacher, and I used to teach permaculture to young adults, I would always start out by saying, what do you want to learn this year? 
we'll make a big list of all the things you want to learn. So at the end, we can tick them off. We can check that you've learned all the things that you want to do. So I would, I, so I would start out by saying, there's a climate emergency. You want to learn engineering. I want you at the end of the three years to be the best engineers that you can be. But you need to be engineers in service to the climate emergency. And actually, how can the skills we learn here out to be of service to that? So that's what I would do, and I, and I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would look around and I would see all of the people here who are running projects that are responding to the climate emergency, and I would say, how can our students help? Are there transition groups here that could do with some engineering students to come along and help them design things? Uh, how can I make sure that the students at the beginning of the course really understand the, the, uh, understand the climate emergency and understand the situation that we're in? And then I would kind of move forward from there, really. But I think, I think that actually in the same way that when I talked about Paris in 1968, I think that a university that declared a climate emergency across all of its subjects would be the most exciting university to be part of. Because you already saw in 2008, when the, when the economic crash happened, students in economics universities around the world went on strike and said, why are you teaching us this shit? Why are you teaching us this, this stuff that is blatantly untrue and has just nearly destroyed the world economy and we know it's not, and we know it's not right? So I think, that, I think that's what will happen anyway. You will see students who go to engineering classes who teach them engineering as though climate change isn't a problem will just say, actually, we, well, we're, we're not staying for this. You're not teaching us responsibly. So I, I would say get the university to declare a climate emergency and then amazing things will happen. So it's, a, it's a le tour d'un homme. Je vais parler en anglais. Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous. Euh, je me pose la question de savoir si une des grandes difficultés pour le changement n'est pas notre approche de la mort et notre peur de cette mort. Et je pense qu'il y a maintenant d'autres façons d'aborder notre finitude que simplement d'être enterré, d'être brûlé. Et si on peut montrer que dans la mort, on crée la vie et qu'on se poursuit au travers de cela, eh bien, on peut vraiment amener une nouvelle approche, avoir un futur, même dans, même dans la mort. Il existe des, des nouvelles formes euh, allez, de de finitude, on appelle ça l'humusation, et qui permet de faire confiance en la nature pour transformer tout ce qu'on a, allez, tout ce qu'on a acquis, et de, de transmettre notre vie à toute une série d'autres choses. Et donc, est-ce que ce n'est pas là un, un point très fort euh, changer cette histoire de la mort en vie, on voit que énormément de, de recherches vont sur vivre plus longtemps, surtout pour certains. Et donc, si on pouvait changer ça, ça pourrait aider à changer cette histoire. Quel est votre point de vue sur ce point particulier Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think. I mean, I have some friends who run a, a funeral business and they, and they do that basically like composting people, yeah? Yeah. Because when we burn people, uh, it's terrible for the air and... Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like that to happen to me. Uh, and I think, I think you're right. If we can start to change the story about, uh, about what happens and, and how can we... How can we How can when we die we become part of nurturing? I'd be happy just to be put in the ground and have a walnut tree planted on top of me. That would be, I would be very happy. That would be a good legacy, I think. Uh, but maybe there's not enough ground for that, I don't know. But yeah, I think, you know, all of, these, all of these things, we need to be discovering new ways to talk about them and new ways to, 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 to celebrate death. And um, I have friends who run the most amazing... Uh, funeral undertaking business which they do the most fantastic 
uh, funerals for people and real celebrations and uh, yeah, I think yeah, I think you're right. Thank you for that. Merci. Moi, j'avais juste une question par rapport à l'actualité. Euh, on parle du Frankensteck, la viande in vitro, et certains présentent ça comme une solution euh, à l'agriculture intensive. Donc voilà, c'était juste pour avoir votre avis par rapport à, à ça. The Frankensteck. <laughs> Do you mean the, like what they call the impossible burger or something? Oh, okay. Okay. I I have a I tend to have a natural disinclination to anything where I don't understand the ingredients. Do you know, if I read it and I I don't know what any of it is, then I tend to think there must be a different way of doing it. You know, I, there's a funny, I've, I've been vegetarian since I was 14, for which I thank punk rock uh, enormously. And, uh, um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? I got distracted. The punk rock, definitely. Oh, yeah. So I never felt, you know, when you, go, when you become vegetarian, people who eat meat go, oh, a bacon sandwich, that'll break you. And it never did. It was never of any interest particularly. But there's this idea that somehow we have to keep making pretend meat things because actually people who are vegetarian really want a sausage and they really want a burger. But actually vegetarian and vegan food is so diverse and amazing and wonderful and interesting. You know, you don't give up smoking and go around eating, picking up loads of things that are shaped like cigarettes. You know, everyone's designing things shaped like cigarettes. It's slightly strange. I don't know what I'm talking about, really. But no, I don't, I've never seen one. I've never seen one. And I think I would distrust it. And I would probably have one made of something else. Because you can make really nice burgers out of some nuts and some breadcrumbs and some eggs. And that's really nice and good for you as well. <laughs> There's a question here. And anything, well, presumably Frankenburger isn't the name they market it under. No. Is that what they don't? They, you don't go into a supermarket and it's called the Frankenburger. <laughs> uh, bonjour. Uh, donc, bah, moi, d'abord, uh, votre première image uh, avec uh, le policier en gilet jaune qui uh, arrêtait votre femme activiste, c'était un petit peu l'inverse de, des policiers qui arrêtent uh, des activistes en gilet jaune. <laughs> en France et en Belgique. Euh, et donc, justement, ma question, c'était... Euh, <rire> un petit décalage horaire d'une heure, je sais. Euh, <rire> c'est une petite story du, du Brexit. Mais euh, ma question, justement, c'était ça. C'était, est-ce euh, que euh, la transition a un rapport, justement, avec la culture et la situation vécue politiquement dans un pays Parce que, justement, euh, vous parliez de, de l'imagination, et ça, je pense que c'est le propre de l'homme et de toutes les cultures, mais quand vous parlez des jeux, quand vous parlez euh, de, de, de différents exemples, je pense que... Enfin, j'attends votre réponse par rapport à ça, mais euh, dans différents contextes politiques et dans différentes cultures, ben, la transition peut euh, être des choses différentes, ou peut représenter des choses différentes. Par, par, par exemple, ça peut être parfois plus rigide dans certains pays, et parfois ça peut être justement du jeu, euh, dans d'autres pays. Et donc voilà. Donc est-ce qu'il y a un rapport entre la transition et la culture et la situation vécue Yeah, euh... absolutely. So, so for me, so transition is not like a Coca-Cola franchise. It's not like uh, everybody gets the same transition and and you have to do it like this and you do this and you do this and you do this. You know, transition in Belgium doesn't look the same as transition in Italy or the same as transition in Brazil or the same as transition anywhere. You know, transition is like a, an invitation to do something extraordinary, and we give some values and some principles and some simple tools, and then you create your own manifestation of it. 
So Transition in Brazil uh, probably has the best parties, uh, and they work, in, they work in different ways, and every place has to figure out, and that's why, that's, why, um, that's why Transition is so important, because you can't work like that if you are a central government. You, you tend to work in the same way in every place. When you are working in a community and you understand the community, you work in a different way. In Scotland, in a place called Black Isle, the transition group there created a project called uh, uh, the Million Mile Project, where they wanted to cut the amount of car use uh, and they by a million miles, I think, uh, by promoting cycling, by promoting car sharing, by promoting walking. And because they were the people from that place who understood the place and who knew all the different people and who had all the networks, they actually, it was incredibly successful and they cut the amount of car travel equivalent to driving to the moon and back two and a half times because they were from that place. So for me, absolutely, transition is designed to be something, you know, transition is not a control freak thing. Transition doesn't say, you know, my, one of my favorite stories that probably if you've seen me talk before, you've heard before, was about six years ago, I was invited to London by an organization who supports social entrepreneurs. They said, you are a social entrepreneur and we like what you do, so, and we are a group of very successful business people, and if we like what you do, then we will support your work uh, with, by helping you and helping you with marketing and things like this. So I went up to London, and I gave them a presentation for about 15 minutes about the transition movement and what was happening, and then when I finished, there was a very long silence, and this man said, so what you've done, is create a very powerful brand and then given it away for free to people all over the world and you have no control over them at all. I said, yes, that's it. That's exactly what we've done. Absolutely. <laughs> and he said, he said, that's mad. But it works. That, and that's why it works. So it does look, it looks different everywhere, and that's absolutely how it should be. And, and, and it's a manifestation of that place, and its dreams, and its culture, and its hopes, and that transit, the, the, the tooting twirl that we talked about, that could only have happened in tooting. We couldn't have sort of created a franchise for every group in the country to do a tooting twirl, because it came from that place, and was an answer to the challenges of that place, and was reflected the culture of that place. And that's, for me, a really important aspect of how this stuff works. Thank you. Bien voilà, mais je crois que tout le monde connaît l'histoire du colibri qui pouvait mettre une petite goutte d'eau pour éteindre l'incendie. Et comme on compare le, donc ce, comment, le réchauffement climatique à cet incendie, mais disons parfois ce. Ah oui, on entend rien. Merci. C'est vrai, euh, comment Pierre Rabic euh, parlait de, de enfin, du colibri qui jetait une petite goutte d'eau sur un incendie. Et bon, ben, les, les autres animaux lui disent, mais ça ne sert à rien, cette petite goutte d'eau. Euh, bon, il dit, mais au moins, je fais ma part. Et c'est vrai que dans la transition, il y a énormément de gens de bonne volonté qui font des choses. Mais d'un autre côté, il y a quand même des grosses entreprises, des États qui jettent vraiment euh, des Canada, des Canada d'air, d'huile bouillante sur le feu, quoi. Alors se pose la question, est-ce que ça, moi aussi j'ai envie de faire que des choses positives, mais est-ce que ça vaut la peine parfois de lutter quand même vis-à-vis -vis des Canada d'air ou pas C'est un peu la question, c'est peut-être quelque chose qui est moins positif ou qui est plus transgressif, mais voilà, c'est un peu une question. C'est aussi une question d'un ami que je transmets ici. Ok, thank you. Um, that's a very, very natural thing to feel, I think. And uh, um, I think the, on the only thing that I can be sure of, though, is that if we assume that the change that is necessary is impossible, then it's a guarantee that it won't happen. And if we do that, then we give away all of our power to people who really, really don't deserve it. And actually, a lot of the time, the people who work within those companies don't believe it either when you actually meet them in the bar and you get them on their own and you talk to people, they understand the situation. 
Um, you know, for me, I, I, I think, so where can I put my energy now? What's the most useful place to put my energy? And, and, and I have the deepest admiration for people uh, like, the, like the Extinction Rebellion and organizations that will put their body in the way and say, this is not okay. This is not acceptable anymore. You cannot do that. Uh, you are behaving like a, a psychopathic organization, and that is not acceptable. And I have the hugest admiration for people who do that, and I feel very hopeful with, the, with the, 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 the big rise of that recently. And people who are saying, like it was hilarious, on, on, the, on that one in London, they, the, the Extinction Rebellion's campaign is to say, we need to get as many people arrested as possible. Because that's, what, that's how governments notice that, that people are unhappy. So on that, in, in the one in London, there's a beautiful film of one of the main organizers saying to the policeman, come on, you're not arresting us quickly enough. Come on, all these people here want to get arrested. Come on, hurry up. You know, we've all come here to get arrested. You know? and, I'm, and so I, I feel really hopeful that, that, that that is happening. But I also know from myself that actually that kind of activism can be emotionally exhausting. And, and, and can be, and I, met, I knew lots of people who were involved in the 90s in campaigns to stop roads being built, who put their body in the way and who had really bad burnout for a long, long time. So for me, the ideal is <coughs> that we do some, no, that's not okay, and then we do some transition, and that helps to rebuild our faith in humanity and uh, gives us some time to heal, and then we go back and we do some more, and we can go backwards and forwards. And that feels really important to me. I think, you know, <clears throat> there are many times in history when things look uh, unbeatable and permanent, like the Berlin Wall or things like that, or apartheid, that one day looked completely uh, impossible. They were going to be there forever. And then the next day they were gone. The next day they changed. And there was no way you could see that that was about to happen. It just, the combination of factors meant that the ground underneath was taken away. And my hope is that actually when we see more and more people being concerned about climate change and acting about climate change and talking about climate change, there will come a point when that shift becomes inevitable. And part of that shift will be because we are telling the best stories and we are creating that longing for the kind of future. I don't say to those big companies, you have the power to decide whether that happens or not. You have the power to decide whether that happens or not. And you exercise that power every time you go to the shops, every time you, you decide where you're going to invest, every time you dispend, decide how to spend your time, you are choosing the kind of future that you want to create. So I think that we have far more power than we allow ourselves to believe. And, uh, and uh, so I, I refuse to give my power to those corporations. You keep it here and you build on it what you already have. On va encore prendre une question et après on va ouvrir le bar de produits locaux. Et normalement, c'est le tour d'un homme. Et si les, les, les questions peuvent là-bas en haut, voilà. Les questions peuvent continuer évidemment au bar aussi. Oui. Euh, moi, je voudrais rebondir sur euh, la légende Keshua du Colibri, parce qu'apparemment cette légende n'est pas, euh, elle continue en fait. Euh, et donc cette légende, euh, la suite de cette légende dit en fait que quand le Colibri dit qu'il fait sa part euh, un sanglier. Euh, continue et il entreprit de charger les hommes. Et de ses défenses, il perçait les réservoirs d'essence et les jambes des pyromanes. Le, micro, il va le tatou découvrant la scène, effrayé, interpella ainsi le sanglier. Tu es fou, tu discrédites les efforts du colibri. À mettre les humains en colère, tu risques ta vie et celle de tous les animaux de la forêt. C'est à quoi le sanglier répondit, réveille-toi tatou, je fais ce qui est nécessaire. Et donc moi ma question c'est de savoir si malgré toutes les, tous les efforts de transition qui sont entrepris depuis tant d'années, on remarque tout de même que l'urbanisation continue de plus en plus, de plus en plus fort, qu'il y a, on remarque la destruction de l'environnement, la croissance économique continue, le développement. On parle également de transition énergétique, une transition énergétique basée sur le biogaz, enfin sur le gaz, sur de 
d'autres modes de production énergétique qui utilisent également de nouvelles ressources planétaires. Et donc moi je me demande, est-ce qu'il ne faudrait pas faire justement ce qui est nécessaire Aujourd'hui, quand on parle d'urgence climatique, est-ce que l'urgence c'est pas ça justement Faire ce qui est nécessaire. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, you know, that actually, you know, still, still most of the trends are going in the wrong direction. Huh? You know, if it was a football match, it's half time and we're losing 3-0. But I've seen football matches where people come back and win 5-3. Uh, and in terms of it, is any means necessary? I think, I think that's a personal choice for people. You know, I, 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 I would firmly argue that actually uh, non-violent direct action is, 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 is the best thing to do. But I also think that, uh, that, that we also need, we need the positive and we need, the, we, need, we, know, we need all of those things together. Joanna Macy always talks about you need the holding actions that say no. You need the, uh, you need the positive building of the new world that we want to see. And you need the conscience raising kind of work that, that, that goes on alongside that. So, uh, yeah, my, my hope would be that we, we, we see all the kinds of actions going on. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not one or the other for me. Uh, but my hope is that actually through things like Extinction Rebellion and, you know, we've seen in the UK now that the fracking industry is kind of is dead, really, because of people who have basically put their bodies in the way for the last five years and now the fracking industry is kind of finished there, really. So, but only because those people came out and did that. So absolutely, that's really important. But I know from, from my own experience and from many other people that doing that kind of work uh, uh, takes a big toll on the people who do it. And so actually to be able to then be involved in the positive as well is really good for our, for our mental health, I think. But absolutely, we need both. Yeah. J'avais annoncé qu'il restait une question. Je vois encore plein de mains qui se lèvent. Le bar va, voudrait s'ouvrir. Et la proposition donc, va être de, de continuer la, la soirée au bar. Euh, aussi parce qu'on doit avoir quitté le bâtiment pour 11h du soir. Euh, juste encore, j'ai oublié tout à l'heure dans les remerciements de citer les bénévoles d'Oxfam qui, pendant toute la journée, ont tenu un bar pendant les forums. Donc, je voudrais aussi les remercier. Je voudrais remercier aussi mes collègues au réseau Transition, euh, bénévoles, freelance, salariés, tout le monde, d'avoir donné beaucoup d'énergie, et encore jusque lundi, avec l'Agora de la Transition, à laquelle vous êtes bienvenus, si vous êtes intéressés. Je voudrais vous proposer, si vous avez euh, un peu d'argent dont vous ne savez pas quoi faire, et que vous vous dites, tiens, si cet argent était mis au service de la Transition, plutôt que dans une banque où on ne sait pas trop ce qu'ils en font pour construire des armes ou, ou soutenir l'industrie pharmaceutique ou pétrolière, de, de mettre cet argent au service de la transition là où vous voulez. Ça peut être pour des projets locaux, pour le réseau transition qui a besoin d'être soutenu aussi. Mais je vous propose aussi de réfléchir un petit peu à ça, de dire tiens, comment ça pourrait se passer si euh, là où je, mettais, où je plaçais mon argent, c'était au service de la transition. Et pour clôturer cette soirée et démarrer le bar, je vais rappeler euh, nos deux amis qui vont venir... Euh, dire un dernier petit mot, Maxime et Balint. Merci à Rob et merci à vous. Bonsoir à tous, on espère que ça vous aura plu. Et on espère aussi que vous utiliserez votre imagination. Rendez-vous au bar <rires>